So can you first tell us a little bit of your personal experience growing up in the one-child policy? Well, how did you feel back then, back in China? I think, um, how many people here are Chinese? I'm curious. Yeah, wow, a lot. And then I see a lot of people are my generation too, so I wonder if like... My generation too. <laughs> <laughs> and then I wonder if um, you share um, my experience or is different. So I'm curious to hear from you too. But for me, I feel like because after I was already born and the policy was already there, so it's something that it almost felt like it's in the background of life that always exists there. So I never even like thought about it or like in a way that oh, it should this exist or not? It's always like being taught and it's there. It's, it's like wallpaper that has um, been there. And I did remember. What my mom would tell me, or the village people, because I grew up in a small village, they would talk about abortion, sterilizations, and the word sterilization, jia it was so common that I would hear, like, oh, neighbor went to get sterilization today, or someone is going, just came back from it. It was like somebody went to sh shopping, like that common. The word became a norm that I don't even think about what it means um, until, you know when I became a woman and ended up a mother, and you now think about sterilization and what it actually uh, mean to people. And I think back then it was really like, I didn't, didn't give it too much thought. So what prompted you to make this film then? I think um, be becoming pregnant with my own child was, um, it was, some, it was a unique experience that I remember when I realized I was pregnant, the following week, um, when the pregnancy was confirmed, the following week I noticed a lot of changes, like in my mindset. Like I was a very fearless person. Like usually I don't like I'm not afraid of it, a lot of things. But that week I would walk downstairs, being super careful. I was like, I don't want to fall. I would walk across the street and just like I want to be hit in the car, by a car, like small things like that, and then bigger things is thinking about what would happen to our life in 50 years and in 100 years and what the policies could affect my child's future. And all of those I noticed my, my perspective shifted and I became very um, protective and, um, and also super aware of all the dangers around me and that could be physical danger or like potential future no, like dangers that are going to affect the entire humankind. So all of those became tangible. And so my mom and then I, I was just like, wow, I didn't know this like pregnancy, becoming a mother would change a person, like make you think things that way. And it was around like all of those thoughts. I was like, so like, what would happen to the women like if they don't have Control. Like if they, they can't protect, like how horrible that would be if like, you don't have any control over the safety of your child before he or she was born or after he or she was born. So I started asking my mom, like, also, what was it like when you were pregnant with me? What, what were you thinking? What were you feeling? And, and my mom started telling me all the stories again. But this time when I heard it, even though some of the stories were something I heard before, but it's something it was all different to me. So I, I think because a lot of people probably have heard of uh, One Child Policy in the audience, I'm actually curious because when I watch, I've read a lot of books, I've read a lot of reports on One Child Policy before watching this film, and when I watch the film, some of the image, some of the details of the stories are still shocking to me. So I just want to, I just would like to see a show of hands. How many of you think, you know, thought you'd learn something new from this film? Just curious. Oh wow, okay, that speaks to the power of the film. Even though you have read in words a lot of the information is all on child policy, but when you actually see how it goes in personal, that's still really powerful. So what did you find during the filming of uh, filming process? What are the, some of the biggest surprises to you? There were many things, like abortion, sterilization, not the things that I already knew. And the number was shocking to me when the midwife said 57 to 60,000. And she broke down like why she got the number, because she kept attracting. And that was a little shocking because 
if she as a village, a small village midwife, could have done so much, what about like other villages and you know how many villages are there in China? And but I think more shocking, which I didn't know before making this film, was the orphanage stories. How in Shaolin, Hunan, some of the officials would go and take the uh, kid away, and then the excuses that they used to take away the kids. A lot of the details were not in the film because it was just so complicated. For example, um, there was one family. Um, whose firstborn child was taken away and sent to the orphanage. And you would question, like, how, why the government could do it. And then, in fact, what they used was, in a lot of villages in China, um, the marriage is, um, you know, getting married um, um, through the government was a new thing after 1949. Before then, there was no marriage certificate. It was not legal. So a lot of Chinese rural areas, um, they still get married by having a huge like banquet and invite relatives and it's that kind of contract and agreement. So they don't necessarily go into the government and get the piece of paper. And that couple happened, didn't get the certificate, marriage certificate. They were married like um, two, two or three years ago before their children were born. And everybody in the village attended that celebration and knew that they were married. But the government came and said, your marriage is invalid, is uh, illegal, so we take the child away. And that was the case. And that was just one example. And so some of those stories were really shocking to me. And um, other things, I think, the officials and how they also suffered a lot of trauma and pain and regret and guilt. And that was something also new until like, the moment I should talk to them. So I think in China we tend to talk about the 100 years of humiliation, right? And then it <laughs> seems to be after the humiliation is another 50 years of trauma, tragedy, one tragedy after another. Um, but it just seems like in China a lot of people we tend not to either think about the historic traumas or we try to overlook it while it's happening near us. Um, why, why do you think it, it is that? Like a lot of the story you describe in, in the film that happened all over China. It's not just, it, it's not like every day, but it's also not extremely isolated. So people know about it. But why do you think there's a general blase about it? Just like we're, we're so used to this. I think two things education and media. And those are two things that actually shape everyone, how they think. Like what is the right and the wrong? The entire sense of morality was shaped by education and media. And if you imagine like all the textbooks and throughout different types of media is talking about how one child policy was positive and necessary and um, beneficial to the entire universe, I think it's really hard for anyone to like to be independently questioning what what he or she was taught. And I think. Most people, at least I met, like so far, the activists, not related to one child policy, but in general, activists in general in China, human rights activists or lawyers, they eventually became awake because something had happened to them, something that they witnessed or directly um, involved. And I think a lot of um, people in China, they are, if nothing had triggered you, to question the injustice, you probably live in that, you know, environment forever and never see the other side or start asking things. So I, I think in this film, this film is also not just a powerful entitlement against the one child policy, it's also entitlement against uh, government propaganda, right? Um, and, uh, you know, for, I'm, I hope I'm not doing a smaller um, you know, you're working on a, a film, new film about Cuban dissident. Based on your experience, you know, interacting with the Cuban uh, society, what do you think are some of the common themes of propaganda everywhere, and what are some things that can be unique about the Chinese way of propaganda? Well, I think uh, propaganda doesn't 
does not only exist in Cuba, China, uh, Cuba, China, or like all the you know like the countries that is known for human rights abuses, but also exist in uh, free countries here um, and a lot of uh, democratic countries. So, like self-identified democratic countries have a lot of propaganda too. It's not unusual. I think as long as there is government, there is propaganda. As long as there is media that being controlled or influenced by the government, then it's being used to promote something that is advancing the government's agenda. So, it, and then it's actually more um, dangerous. Like if propaganda, propaganda exists in countries like here, that's uh, presumably freer because then you overlook even more and the propaganda is even subtler that you don't you don't see it so overly you don't get criticism and it's like all the social media that you saw and um, all the election campaigning that is not like unique and I think in China and Cuba for example I think I would say the difference is um, the information is so restricted um, in both countries. Um, I'm talking about Cuba because you brought it up that I was working on a film, I'm working on a film on it. But like both of them entirely restrict outside information um, being accessed by the by the uh, people there. And the censorship and the restriction is very effective um, in different ways. But I think that's um, one striking difference from other places. So, any place after you made the film, what do you think are some of the uh, lasting impact of the one child policy? It seems like right now, yeah, as you mentioned at the end of the film, why in the two child policy moment, everybody's talking about two ch children now, right? In China, not one child. I think it's the consequences are in all different aspects of social, economic, and even like anthropological that you look at this like 35 years um, entire entire society has been like um, you know like shaped in a different way um, a lot of like a common themes that like have been uh, in the media featured in the media a lot is like a gender imbalance and also the like lack of workforce and how that would affect the economy in the next um, 20 years and the elder care, but also I think a lot of the psychological impact is never dealt with or never reported because there are a generation of parents who most of them have, su have suffered losing a child or, you know, um, or more than one, and a new generation who um, both sides, like who grew up without siblings, and then their child is going to grow up without uncles and aunts and cousins and how that would shape the social structure. And on the other side also the adoptees, like now they are going to be in their 20s and 30s too and a lot of them are going to become parents themselves. And how becoming a parent would trigger them and wanting to find out what exactly happened and where their parents are. And I think those are all upcoming. Like the next 10 years, it will, it will come out more. I'm also curious, how many in the audience are one child? Raise your hand. Elderly care will be a big burden on you someday. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, the last question for me, I, I will take some questions from the audience, is that I'm really interested in your mom's perspective, because in the film, you briefly mentioned there's a difference in, in terms of the views between you and your mom, but one child policy. Can you tell us a little bit more about how different your views are? And do, do you guys argue about that or not? Of course. Don't we? Like, don't we all argue with our moms? <laughs> yeah. Um, my mom, um, most recently, was um, when we released the film theatrically in August, she attended the um, theatrical opening at Film Forum. and one of the audience members asked her how she felt about it, and she said, yeah, I still support the policy. And, and I was uh, very shocked, but like that night when we were going back in the cab together, so I couldn't argue that much in the audience, so we argued throughout the car ride. And 
So I wanted to film that. <laughs> so I asked her, why do you think so? And what she said more was actually more shocking to me. Um, she basically said, um, Chinese people have low quality, that education is not going to work in China. It's a narrative that she went on saying, like, why voting is uh, not going to work because we have so many people and the, in general, the population quality is low, like, intellectual level is low. And I was very, she's like, it's not like Americans or Japanese or anybody. So like, how did you get this theory? And, um, and then we kept talking and I was shocked. And I couldn't understand why somebody would have, a, a, or a nation would have kind of that low self-esteem, but at the same time also um, strong um, patriotism, nationalism. Whenever they would say a film like this, my friend, a lot of them criticized me for making the film that shows the negative image of China because we should all protect the image. So it's like both sides was, so that night after arguing with my mom, I went back to think because her theory and the narrative was very familiar to me because I heard many people say that. And I was like, what did it come from? And I started thinking and thinking and I realized in my textbook, like if you go back in, um, middle school textbook, high school textbook, and elementary school. It's like word by word it says, 中国人口多素质低, which means like China has huge population and low quality. And then it will, it will also say like, because 80% of the Chinese people are peasants, so we have like in general like high illiteracy and low quality people. So like our, and then some other theory is, the basic human rights is survival rights and um, development rights. These are two like blanks I need to like every exam, every test throughout my life I had to like fill out so I can memorize a lot of those terms and then I realized it basically told you that we have low quality population and all we need is to survive and freedom of speech, freedom of expression any other reproductive rights, all the rights are not like important and not something that you should even like fight for or like like be aware of. It's like, I think like yeah, so it was the difference between me and my mom not a lot. <laughs> any resolution inside? No, well, no. My mom was like eventually she couldn't argue, like she would just be silent. She she couldn't like she has no words after. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, we're going to open up for some questions from the audience. Uh, okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks for sharing this film. Um, uh, I have two questions. The first one is, uh, I'm, I'm very curious about the two officials or the family planning officials you choose. Um, I just wonder if there's any uh, difficult, difficulty to sign the release form with them, because I, I'm worried that they may push back the film was, is released if there's no release. The second question is, um, I'm, as a Chinese, I'm shocked about the second part of this film, especially about the orphanage, the government's corrupt, corrupt um, the government thing. Uh, so during production, have you considered to shift your focus to the second part because it's, uh, there are a lot of new information in it? The first question, so basically all the people in our film, almost all of them, I think, that we signed the release after the film was done. Um, in China, a lot of people have like concerns about signing any paperwork, especially the less educated, the more concerned they will be because they don't understand what it actually means and they are very afraid. So we signed all the release after the film was done and um, some of them, like for the people who live in Hong Kong or Beijing, which we have access to, like, uh, I mean, like, safer ways of showing them the entire film without being afraid of, like, um, you know, piracy or losing this to the government. We showed them the entire film with others that we don't have safe ways. We showed them the segments of their own, like, part. And it's interesting because the official, they all, like, saw their own part, and they were all fine with it because they, it's like, yeah, this is all true. This is like, <laughs> exactly it is. Like, they, like, the midwife, for example, she was very proud of, like, 
pride because she did feel like she was, um, uh, you know, um, atoning for seeing men. And the second question, you mean like shift the focus to, to do more on the second part? Or, yeah. um, no, because um, it's not like more or less, I think. It's um, the first, like if you were saying the first is, they are both important. I think what I wanted is the film could exist in the world, in the history, in the next 50, 100 years, if anybody wanted to know what really the one policy was about and it happened, at least there is some kind of, um, there is a record that is available for them to see and can give them um, a perspective that the other, like what they could get from the Chinese history. History is always written by the ruling class. By the, um, so I hope that this could serve that purpose and so whether the second part or the, uh, the orphanage government corruption and the first part, I think they are equally important. And um, in terms of the weight of um, them, it was, I think it was hard to say because there's a lot of editing and transition flow in and um, yeah, there was, there was no like very intentional calculation because of the corruption, how much it should be. Thank you, that was terrific. Um, I have two questions. One is about the two-child policy that you mentioned at the end. Um, from what I understand from the data, it doesn't really seem to be working in terms of converting people. And I was curious if you saw any signs that the government will um, turn towards more, you know, stronger measures, more coercive measures, um, such as restricting access to contraception or something like that, beyond the propaganda. Um, and I was also curious, and I apologize, I came in a bit late, so I may have missed this in the first few minutes, but did you want to or try to talk to any of the very senior people? So my understanding is the policy was designed by engineers who didn't have a good understanding of social science, um, and at least in the beginning, and then I think there was more people with a social, you know, a sociology background brought in and to do the demography, but did you try to show them the kind of human cost of their policy? Because it seems like there was so many levels, you know, in the hierarchy that there may have been some detachment. Um, the first question about the two-child policy, yes, we did see a lot of, like, measures that were taken by local governments. For example, like, one um, local area, they would um, ask um, any new couple who register for marriage to put down the deposit, like a thousand yuan, uh, sorry, like five thousand yuan, like five hundred dollars, I believe, or like, uh, not doing the math right, but put in a certain amount of a deposit when they get married, and they can only get this deposit back when they bring the birth certificate of their second child. So that's like one, and because the government, you know, is every government official has their own territory and whether this official can get a promotion or, you know, um, or not. A lot of them depending on how they have done, like in, let's say, raising the population in the local area. So they're doing everything they could. Um, the second question, whether I have talked to engineers of the policy, I mean, like the initial, um, it, was, it was not possible, like, to do that in China. So, uh, let's limit uh, one question per person. Okay. Okay. So, we can, we can get to talk to one question. Hi, um, there's a part of the problem that is talking about um, how Chinese families tend to value or prefer boys over girls. Um, I'm wondering how you think this is related to the one child. Yeah, um, Chinese um, Chinese culture has always been a patriarchy culture for thousands of years that men are valued much more than women. And a lot of times, especially like um, 100 years ago, 500 years ago, women's value a lot depends on their reproductive value. So like whether she can give birth to a son to the family, you know, like determines how much she's valued in this family. And so that actually compounded the one-child policy 
because it has always been that culture. And when the one child policy started, it made family, it forced the family to choose, like, um, if they could only have one chance and um, to keep the child. And because of that part of culture, it, I think it caused absolutely like the female abandonment much more so than before the one child policy. Hi, uh, thanks a lot for this um, film. Um, I believe a lot of us learned a lot about the things that we didn't know on the negative side of this one child policy. Uh, I'm just curious, um, during, the, during the production, have you uncovered anything that's positive for this policy that you didn't know before? And if so, how are you planning to communicate it out? And if not, um, is there any reason that you think that um, that makes you think that this is a, a subjective or objective view. If I have to uncover something that I didn't know before, that is positive. Positive, positive uh, part of the... Hmm, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have an answer already? <laughs> Usually I have um, positive effects. Well, um, I've uh, been to uh, screenings and then I've met Chinese audience, and I have had um, girls um, who told me that, well, I appreciate the policy because if it would not be because of the policy, I wouldn't have the kind of education I, I could have now. My family would have placed everything on the, my brother, but because I'm the only child, so I was allowed to go to university to come to the United States. So some people have told me that they felt um, that was the benefit of it. And I think to a certain extent, the policy did enhance women's um, status or value to some extent, to some degree, because when the family didn't have a choice and eventually only had a daughter and they did place all the resources they have on this daughter and value her in, or force themselves to um, maintain their prejudice. But to me, I, I felt very um, sad and mixed about that because I recognized that one unintended consequences that happened that was like quote unquote positive to some people. But I also recognized if you, if someone could believe that that's positive because you have benefited from it, it's very dangerous because if we allow a, a country to intentionally um, um, let's say, decrease the population so everybody else could enjoy more resources, then the next step, it could eliminate people who are, like, let's say, less fitting for the society, and so the rest, higher quality can enjoy more resources. It's not that far from that. So if we can do this and agree that this can make a, a part of the population benefit, from, like from getting more resources, then we're not that far going to the next step and saying, well, we should get rid of the, you know, the, um, just like, you know, dividing people by whatever quality they have. So. Yeah, I think one um, possible positive is that Chinese family nowadays, uh, especially in other cities, now, they're used to the idea of having a very small family, a small nuclear family. In the past, it's like, the more kids you have, the better. But after the shock of the one-child policy, and especially with the rising costs, social costs, education costs in big cities, most families nowadays they prefer to have one kid. They don't actually don't, don't want to or cannot afford to have two kids. But that's also the the irony, which is like China needs the population to grow up to to, to take care of its own uh, seniors. But right now, population is shrinking very fast. Whoever gets the mic. <laughs> uh, hey, um, so my question is, uh, you know, in some uh, environmental circles, there's concern about things like carbon output, environmental footprint of people, and you know, there's this subtle message, or maybe not so subtle message, that you shouldn't have children. If you do have children, you should have one. If you have two children, you know, you're borderline. If you have three, you're like really not a great person. Uh, and I'm curious. I mean, of course, it's not politically salient to, to have any kind of coercive recommendation behind that in the United States, but for people who are messaging, 
practice your message in that way. Do you have any response um, to that to that idea, or do you feel like, well, if it's family's choices, there's there's like that's fine and it's an okay thing to put out in the political sphere? I do believe this is an individual's choice and it's um it's family choice and it's also a woman's own choice. And I do not think I I'm all for like you know. Um, we should all protect the environment, but I do believe um, it's two separate conversations. It's not by um, man-made massive like extinction of like humankind or eliminate a certain like uh, you know race or like people or anything like or any country. I think um, we could all find other ways to do that. And in terms of like reproductive rights, I do believe it's the basic rights that, as a human, that we should enjoy. Um, did you experience any pressure while you were making the film from the government or since it's been released? And were you concerned about repercussions um, that might affect your family? Um, during the making of it, we, we took a lot of precautions to try to stay under the radar of the government. So really like a go in and out really quick. And um, I never, like except for one one time, never took public transportation or stayed in a hotel. So all of those were trying to stay like away from any um, check-in system that the government has. Um, so luckily we have like a few incidents that were nerve-wracking, but eventually the production went without um, trouble. And since the film's out, what we've noticed is we knew that the film was censored. Like There were pages about the film that existed today that the next day would be taken down and um, things like that. And uh, in terms of direct confrontation or contact from the government, I haven't gotten any yet. And my family also, none of the people in the, in the film has been contacted by the film, by the government. So we're running out of time. Nothing can tell us where we can watch the film, where they can tell the friends to watch the film. I think it's still playing in a film forum um, uh, in theater. And later this year, I think, I believe, like in the winter, it will come out on Amazon Prime. And PBS? And early next year, I believe, it's PBS. PBS. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's playing in a lot of cities, I think, like over 60 cities in America in theaters. So. You can find the list of the theaters on watchfoundation.com. Great. Thanks so much for coming this day.